It was during one of those late nights that Eddie Diamond first brought up the tantalizing possibility. It was an offhand comment, a joke, really. What they should do, Eddie said, was pull some bucks and bring in a few mamazons from Saigon, spice things up. And after a moment, one of the men laughed and said, our own little EM club. And somebody else said, hey, yeah, we pay our fucking dues, don't we? It was nothing serious, just passing time, playing with the possibilities. And so for a while, they tossed the idea around, how you could actually get away with it. No officers or anything, nobody to clamp down. Then they dropped the subject and moved on to cars and baseball. Later in the night, though, a young medic named Mark Fossey kept coming back to the subject. Look, if you think about it, he said, it's not that crazy. You could actually do it. Do what, Rat said. You know, bring in a girl. I mean, what's the problem? Rat shrugged. Nothing. A war. Well, see, that's the thing, Mark Foss, he said. No war here. You could really do it. A pair of solid brass balls. That's all you'd need. There was some laughter, and Eddie Diamond told him he'd best strap down his dick. But Fossey just frowned and looked at the ceiling for a while, and then the went way off Rat to write a letter. It, she came in by helicopter along with the daily resupply shipment out of Chu Lai. A tall, big-boned blonde. At best, Rat said, she was 17 years old, fresh out of Cleveland Heights Senior High. She had long white legs and blue eyes, and a complexion like strawberry ice cream. On the first night, they set up house in one of the bunkers along the perimeter, near the special, special forces hutch, and over the next two weeks, they stuck together like a pair of high school steadies. It was almost disgusting, Rat said the way they mooned over each other, always holding hands, always laughing over some private joke. All they needed, he said, were a couple of matching sweaters. During her first days in country, she liked to roam around the compound asking questions. What exactly was a trip flare? How did a claymore work? What was behind those scary green mountains to the west? Then she'd squint and listen quietly while somebody filled her in. She had a good, quick mind. She paid attention. Often, especially during the hot afternoons, she would spend time with the ARVNs out along the perimeter, picking up little phrases of Vietnamese, learning how to cook rice over a can of sterno, how to eat with her hands. The guys sometimes liked to kid her about it, her own little native, they'd say. But Marianne would just smile and stick out her tongue. I'm here, she said. I might as well learn something. She wasn't dumb, Rat said. I never said that. Young, that's all I said. Like you and me. A girl, that's the only difference. And I'll tell you something. It didn't amount to Jack. I mean, when we first got here, all of us, we were real young and innocent. Full of romantic bullshit. But we learned pretty damn quick. And so did Marianne. Once or twice, gently, Mark Fossey suggested that it might be time to think about heading home. But Marianne laughed and told him to forget it. Everything I want, she said, is right here. All right, start at the start, Rat said, nice and slow. Sleeping with who? I don't know who. Eddie Diamond. Eddie? Has to be. The guy's always there, always hanging on her. Rat shook his head. Man, I don't know. Can't say it strikes the right note. Not with Eddie. Yes, but he's... Easy does it, Rat said. He reached out and tapped the boy's shoulder. Why not just check some bunks? We got nine guys. You and me? That's two, so there's seven possibles. Do a quick body count. Fossey hesitated. I can't if she's there. I mean, with somebody... Rat pushed himself up. He took the flashlight, muttered something, and moved down to the far end of the hutch, going quickly from room to room, using the flashlight to pluck out the faces. Eddie Diamond slept a hard, deep sleep. The others, too. To be sure, though, Rat checked once more, very carefully. Then he reported back to Fossey. All accounted for, no extras. Rat stopped there and looked at Mitchell Sanders for a time. So, what's your vote? Where was she? The greenie, Sanders said. Yeah? Sanders smiled. No other option. The stuff about the special forces, how they used the place as a base of operations, how they'd glide in and out, all that had to be there for a reason. That's how stories work, man. Rat thought about it, then shrugged. All right, sure, the greenies. But it's not what Fossey thought. She wasn't sleeping with any of them. At least, not exactly. I mean, in a way, she was sleeping with all of them, more or less. Except it wasn't sex or anything. They were just lying together, so to speak. Marianne and these six grungy, weirded-out green berets. Lying down? You got it. <laughs> ambush. All night long, man. Marianne's out on fucking ambush. Near the end of the third week, Fossey began making arrangements to send her home. At first, Rat said, Marianne seemed to accept it. 
but then after a day or two she fell into a restless gloom, sitting off by herself at the edge of the perimeter. She would not speak. Shoulders hunched, her blue eyes opaque. She seemed to disappear inside herself. A couple of times, Fossey approached her and tried to talk it out, but Marianne just stared out at the dark green mountains to the west. The wilderness seemed to draw her in. A haunted look, Rat said. Partly terror, partly rapture. It was as if she had come up on the edge of something, as if she were caught in that no-man's land between Cleveland Heights and deep jungle. Seventeen years old, just a child, blonde and innocent. But then, weren't they all? The next morning, she was gone. The six greenies were gone.